Well, Senator Joe Manchin has faced some backlash for various right-wing positions that he's taken with regards to stimulus checks and now filibusters. Another Dem has seemingly gone under the media radar. Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona is apparently also adamant against eliminating the filibuster and is not open to any negotiations on that topic. Here to discuss is host of The Humanist Report, Mike Figueredo. Great to see you, Mike. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So just tell me, how are you thinking about this whole filibuster fight? The latest update is now McConnell sort of caved. He was holding up this power sharing agreement, requiring Dems to commit that they wouldn't eliminate the filibuster. But since he got direct assurances from both both Manchin and Cinema that they will not vote to eliminate the filibuster, he felt, I guess, comfortable to move forward. How significant do you think that all of this ultimately is? I think it really is significant because when it comes to, you know, the majority that Democrats hold, you know, it, it's razor thin, obviously, with the vice president being the tie breaking vote. So every single piece of legislation is going to get filtered through Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, which are the worst Democrats. They know that they're kind of like the moderates and they have so much power right now because both parties are going to be jockeying them for support or, you know, to, to get on board with whatever. So it's really frustrating because now is not the time for grandstanding. Now is the time for, you know, Democrats to actually accomplish things. But when you have individuals like Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin who don't actually care about serving anyone but their donors, you know, you're going to see situations like this where, you know, they're going to uh, hold everyone back. When Democrats actually want to do something good, there are going to be individuals within the party that stop them from doing that, which is really frustrating. Yeah. And I also think, I mean, with it being such, I mean, it's tied technically. And then you have, as you point out, the vice president who's that tie breaking vote. Any one or a few members could really wield a lot of power. So why does it seem like it's always the right wing members who are the ones who are willing to flex that muscle versus the left wing um, members? And I saw Joe Biden out yesterday talking about, oh, maybe we should look at further means testing the $1,400, which was supposed to be the $2,000 to start with. Why aren't they also looking at the negotiations on the other side of the caucus? Yeah, that's a really uh, great question. Uh, I I wish that, you know, the left and there's not many leftists in the U.S. Senate, you know, at least not as much as the House. But I I wish that, you know, that were the case where they would be looking to uh, Bernie Sanders and whatnot. And Bernie Sanders as budget committee chairman, you know, he's trying to give them an easy way to actually uh, do something for their constituents deliver. Uh, But, you know, the problem is that these conservative Democrats in the House, Joe Manchin, Kirsten Cinema, you know, they don't actually, um, I'm losing my train of thought here. It's early on the West Coast, sorry. Um, <laughs> they, you know, the problem is that they oftentimes side with Republicans more so than the moderate Republicans side with Democrats. And I think this kind of comes down to leadership in a way. Uh, you know, Chuck Schumer, he's a feckless leader. And as much as I hate Mitch McConnell, he actually does get Republicans to hold their ground. And even when you see individuals like Susan Collins, she'll grandstand for weeks and then ultimately she'll side with Republicans. We don't see that leadership on the Democratic Party side. So there's no discipline there. And you have individuals like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema who actually will, you know, they'll choose to not go along with Democrats. And I think that the leftists like Bernie Sanders, like Sometimes he does play hardball. Sometimes he is a little bit more strategically, you know, set on trying to get things accomplished. Like he's been effective throughout the course of the pandemic. But, you know, when it comes to Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, they're ruthless and they don't actually care that people are suffering. So they will hold up this. You know, it's if you want to play chicken with them, they'll end up winning because they don't actually care to them. It's all about delivering for, you know, corporate America. They don't actually care about their constituents. And I think that's why they hold more power. Because, you know, they don't want to hold up votes. You know, it was kind of what we saw with the first round of stimulus negotiations where progressives really wanted more, uh, but they were afraid that they were holding it up. And, you know, they kind of got steamrolled by corporate Democrats and Nancy Pelosi, at least with regard to the House. Um, So, yeah, I was thinking about this, you know, over the course of all of these negotiations. I really wish that it was the left flank of the party who had more leverage. But unfortunately, uh, that is never the case. It's always, you know, the lowest 
you know, the right wingers are the lowest common denominators. You make a really good point, which is basically like the left wing's morality and desire to actually get something done is like weaponized against them. Is it's like, well, you yeah, can't totally. hold this up because then you're going to get absolutely nothing. And so then ultimately go, well, gosh, I mean, something is better than nothing and we've got to get help to people. So ultimately that gets weaponized against them. I think that's a really good point. You know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, Mike, is how do you how are you sort of looking at the Biden administration? What metrics are going are you going to use to judge his success or failure? And this is actually what I did my radar on today is like, you know, I see these executive orders. I saw you cover the executive orders also on Humanist Report. They're like very positive, rolling back some of the terrible things that Trump did, getting back in the Paris climate deal. Today, there's um, new actions with regard to climate change, all sort of positive incrementalist steps. But also they seem to be one-offs divorced from a larger vision of how we really need to address these massive structural issues that we face in the country right now. So how are you sort of judging the Biden administration? What would you consider to be like a success? What would you give him credit for? How are you assessing his actions so far? Yeah, I think that's a great question, especially for leftists now. And, you know, my response has been, to um, have very low expectations, like the bar is below the floor. So <laughs> any positive that I can see, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to celebrate that in a really dark time. But ultimately, I, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, Kyle Kalinske of Secular Talk made a phenomenal point about how, you know, Joe Biden's strongest point, at least from the standpoint of leftists, is that his first couple of weeks when he undoes the things that Trump instituted, namely via executive order, that's going to be his most strongest uh, time where the left is going to say, wow, He's doing a lot. But as you said, you know, if we don't actually see structural changes, then when you step back and look at the Biden years, ultimately, we're not going to see it amount to much. So what we really need is for Democrats, you know, I don't I don't really expect like a lot of sweeping policies like none of us are expecting Medicare for all over these next couple of years. But if Democrats don't at least save democracy in the sense that they institute reforms that unrig elections so this minority party republicans don't continue to win then you know people aren't going to look back at these years very fondly we're going to look back at joe biden as well he's just the guy that defeated donald trump whereas we need to look back at this era as one you know of, of ambition and actually thinking big and you know there are things that i think even corporate democrats would agree need to get accomplished uh, that would make a significant change. So, I mean, we need a new Voting Rights Act. We need universal suffrage. We need to make voting a national holiday. You know, I, I think that we need to look at statehood for D.C., allow Puerto Rico uh, self-determination. If they don't do these things and at least fix democracy, try to curtail money in politics at least a little bit, then this isn't going to be an era uh, of change, which is desperately what's needed right now, because anything that Joe Biden does via executive order, even if that's positive, it can just easily be undone like that by the next Republican administration. And what I ultimately fear is that if they don't actually take this time, capitalize on this unique opportunity and deliver to the American people, materially speaking, then a Republican is going to come to power who's a more effective fascist, uh, you know, than Donald Trump. And people are going to check out. And if they check out, Democrats will lose power because when turnout is lower, we all know what happens. Republicans win. So, you know, my expectations are low, but I think that now is not the time for voters to be complacent. Like, I'm not expecting Joe Biden just on his own unilaterally to just, you know, all of a sudden have a change of heart. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are, what the political context is. I, I think that will hopefully once the pandemic is over uh, or more people are vaccinated, there is that grassroots pressure that we're putting on the Democratic Party because I just don't expect them to, uh, on their own, do what's needed. There has to be that constant grassroots pressure, in my opinion. Yeah, I thought it was really, one of the more encouraging things I've seen is that, I don't know if you follow this, you probably did. Joe Manchin initially came out in an interview with the Washington Post about the $2,000 checks and he was like, absolutely not. And almost immediately had to start walking it back. Um, a progressive PAC ran ads against him in West Virginia, and he completely basically relented and was like, I didn't say I'm opposed to $2,000 checks. I'm open to it. Let's talk about it. I think that's a really important, it's an important metric. I mean, that happens to be an issue where the public has like 80% support. 
So, and especially in a state like West Virginia, where people would overwhelmingly benefit from this money and are, you know, deserve, really need it and it would help them tremendously, it became an issue where he, even he, the most right wing of Democrats, couldn't ultimately oppose it. So I think your point about the grassroots is really well taken. Do you ultimately think that Joe Biden and the Democratic establishment learned anything from the Obama years? Because basically they had this pattern of they would negotiate with themselves, they would pander and really try to get these Republicans on board and end up with, you know, whether it was the stimulus deal or the health care deal, something that's woefully inadequate that the Republicans still don't vote for. So they've negotiated themselves down for no reason. And then they pay a political price and voters become increasingly cynical and increasingly believe the government can't deliver for me and they're not meeting my expectation, they're not meeting their promises. And lo and behold, for that reason and other reasons as well, we end up with Donald Trump as president. Do you think that Democrats have actually learned anything from that experience? I wish I could say that they did. But uh, no, I don't think that they learned anything. And part of the issue is that the same individuals who were advising them, giving them bad strategic advice back in 2009, 2010, during that era when they lost more than a thousand seats, are the same people who are advising them now. I mean, in the Democratic Party, the way that you get promoted is basically by like failing up. We just saw with Jamie Harrison, he became the DNC chair. This is a corporate lobbyist. He lost the DNC chair race in 2017. He just lost the Senate race, and all of a sudden he gets a promotion. Um, I mean, in terms of who we should be promoting, isn't it people who know how to win elections and get them in more advantageous positions? I mean, Stacey Abrams, she's not necessarily aligned with me ideologically, but at least she knows that the way that Democrats win is to register new voters. And she helped deliver Georgia to Joe Biden and Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. Why aren't you promoting her? I mean, of course, I'd rather have a progressive in that position of DNC chair. But if we're just looking at it from the standpoint of who can win, then you know you have, you have to change the makeup of the party. And they haven't really made any substantial changes. Like the same folks who have influence in the party are still there. So, you know, my my fear is that, let's say, hypothetically speaking, worst case scenario, if I could be a doomer for a moment, you know, mm -hmm. Joe Biden doesn't actually implement the change that's needed and they end up losing in 2022 and they lose in 2024. Um, well, what's going to happen? They're going to look at themselves and they're going to say, man, what did we do? We lost after, you know, Donald Trump was defeated. How could this possibly be? I think the solution is that, you know, we have to be more right wing and appeal to more people. Uh, and, and it's frustrating. Uh, but part of the issue is that, you know, they they don't have the discipline that Republicans have, at least legislatively. And, you know, they they know that their victory is always going to be contingent on getting people out to vote. And you know, not enough of them actually utilize that strategy. So the easier strategy to them, at least, is just to try to appeal to as many moderates as possible, because that is a more reliable voting block. You know, rather than actually getting millennials and Zoomers out to vote who are less reliable, which would deliver them a victory, they don't actually try to do that. So, you know, in terms of answering your question, um, I don't think that they will change. I think that you have to dramatically change the makeup of the party. But, you know, there are institutional, you know, incentives for them to continue being, you know, right wing and corporatist. That is very, very true. And fact of the matter is Joe Biden, as right wing as he is and has been over his career, actually got fewer Republicans to support him this time around than Hillary Clinton did back in 2016, in spite of the efforts of the Lincoln Project and all of these other people. Um, Mike, so great to have you. Everybody should go and subscribe to the Humanist, Humanist Report. Um, grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Of course. And we'll have more rising for you after this.